In this masterclass, I'll be covering some of the new features for crowds in Houdini 15.5. As a brief overview, I'll start out by covering some of the new features that are fairly independent from everything else, like mocap iPad 3, followed by the new versions of the crowd source soft, the crowd solver, and other crowd DOPs. Then I'll move on to covering the new features for controlling transitions between animation clips, foot locking, and terrain adaptation improvement. One new feature in 15.5 is a streamlined workflow for creating agents from an FBX file. Previously, you would have had to do this by first importing the FBX file into the Houdini scene. And then from there, you could take that character rig and either point the agent wrap at it to write out the agent definition files to disk, or you could just directly use the agent soft scene import mode to create the agent primitive. But in 15.5, the agent soft and the agent wrap have a new option that allows you to bypass that intermediate step and directly create the agent definition from an FBX file. So on the agent soft, the input menu has a new option, FBX, which allows you to just provide the path to an FBX file to create the agent from. So similar to the scene import mode, though, you still have controls over what the layer names are, and if you're extracting locomotion information, uh, which transform in the rig to use. Uh, similarly, the agent ROP has an equivalent option. So on the source menu, uh, in addition to pointing at either a character rig or an existing agent primitive, you can point at the path to an FBX file to write out the agent definition files for. And then, of course, you can use those agent definition files with the disk input mode of the agent soft to create the agent primitives. So the primary advantage of this, of course, is just the convenience of not having to do that intermediate step. But there are a few small differences in behavior that are important to mention. So because you avoid that intermediate conversion of the FBX file to a Houdini character rig and then baking it out to an agent, it can be a slightly more robust way of importing the animation data because you don't have to worry about translating things like constraints into their equivalent as object nodes in Houdini. Um, if there are multiple animation stacks or takes in the FBX file, those will actually be translated into multiple clips for the agent, which is a really convenient way to load in a lot of clips from an FBX file. And then finally, uh, because Houdini's default units are meters, the direct FBX import does apply a scale to account for that difference, so that then if you are using the agent in DOPS, like with ragdolls, uh, the agent will be at a reasonable scale to get good behavior. In 15.5, we added a new built-in character, Mocap iPad 3, which is available on the crowd shelf, and it's primarily intended for use with crowd-related tests and demos. It has a pretty wide variety of animation clips, which are all categorized into several different areas. So there's a set of walk, turn, and run cycles, a wide variety of stadium-related standing, cheering, and waving clips, um, several different variations of zombie walk cycles, and some more specific types of clips like crawling, jumping over obstacles, and things like that. A couple of useful things to mention if you're using this for crowds is there's this number of frames label here, which updates based on the number of frames in the currently selected animation clip. And so that's very useful if you're using the agent ROP to write out the animation clips, because that tells you what value you probably want to put into this animation range parameter here, which controls the length of the generated animation clip. And then there's the in-place animation toggle, which controls whether you see the original locomotive animation or an in-place version. So if I have this turned on, you'll just see an in-place walk cycle like that. And turned off, you'll get the original locomotive animation. So you want to switch that depending on whether you're trying to do locomotive animation clips or in-place animation. The agent configure joint stop, which is used for setting up the joint limits for ragdoll, has got a couple of useful workflow updates in 15.5. So previously, when you started setting up the joint limits, they'd be initialized to 30 degree cones. And this wasn't always the best starting point. There's something like the hinge joint at an elbow, you have to do a fair bit of work in order to get the hinge aligned in the correct plane. And if you had a wide variety of animation clips, you'd have to do a lot of tweaking to make sure that the joint limits you had set up were wide enough to encompass the full range of motion. And if you didn't do that, you might get some surprises when your agent switched into a ragdoll because the solver would suddenly start enforcing the joint limits, which can sometimes lead to popping if the joints were outside of those ranges. In 15.5, we added some options to automatically compute the joint limits from the agent's animation clips, which will produce a result more like what you see here. And so with this, you get a hinge that's aligned in the correct plane for the elbow. And for things like the, the knee joints, they're wide enough to encompass the full range of motion in the clip. So this gives you a much more useful starting point for doing further adjustments. And it saves you a lot of that tedious initial work. So there's two new buttons on the agent configure joint stop for setting this up. So at the top, there's a create limits for collision layer button. And what that'll do is it'll take a look at all of the shapes in the agent's collision layer and which transforms they're attached to and use that to decide what joint limits you probably need to create. And then for each of those joint limits, it'll compute the range of motion based on the animation clips. And so there's a button for each entry in the multi-parm that'll do that for you in case you've changed some of the values and you want to reset it to that value. Um, if you're using the configured joint shelf tool to set that up, 
the shelf tool will actually press that button for you and give you the starting point to work with. And then if you're interactively in the state for the configure joint stop and you've maybe edited some of the joint limits a bit and decided you don't like what you've done, you can press Shift C to reset the value to the computed joint limits. Next, I'll be covering the new versions of some of the crowd related nodes in 15.5, starting with version 3.0 of the CrowdSource SOP. Uh, overall, version 3.0 will look pretty similar interface wise to version 2.0, but there were a few backwards and compatible changes that required the version number to be bumped up. So, in this file, I've got a side by side of version 2.0 with version 3.0 of the CrowdSource SOP just to highlight some of the differences. Uh, so, in version 2.0, there, there were these four parameters near the bottom uh, minimax speed, max turn rate, and max force all of which had a pretty large impact on the agent's behavior during the simulation. Uh, the max turn rate and max force parameters are now moved into the new version of the crowd solver because those parameters in particular have a pretty large impact on the behavior of the agent. And so we wanted to put them in a more discoverable place rather than having them being set up in SOPs and not being very easy to find. Uh, the min and max speed parameters have actually been removed entirely because they conflicted with another feature of the crowd solver, which is the speed variance control. So there was an option to set the speed variance to limit the agents to be within you know, 10 or 15% of their gate speed, which worked by setting the speed min and speed max point attributes, which also happened to be the same point attributes that this min and max speed parameter on the crowd source stop created. And so you could end up with some confusing behavior with the interaction between those two features, both modifying the same attributes. And so we decided to just remove the min and max speed controls from the crowd source stop and just control that using the speed variance controls in the DOP simulation. Uh, so moving over to CrowdSource 3.0, uh, the initial state parameter changed a little bit in terms of its default value. So it used to be that the initial state parameter would default to walk. And this could sometimes cause some confusing behavior for people, because if they didn't have a state in their crowd simulation named walk, or they didn't have an animation clip named walk, they could end up with the agents starting out in a bad state and not doing anything because they didn't have any current state that they were in in the simulation. And that could be fairly difficult to debug and trace back to the fact that the CrowdSource SOP had a default value that didn't really work well for their simulation. Uh, so the initial state value actually now defaults to the empty string. And what happens in that case is the agent's initial state will be set based on the name of the current animation clip. And so in this case, in the geometry spreadsheet, you can see that it just got set to walk. And so that is a more forgiving default value. So people can usually end up in a good state and have agents moving around when they start their simulation. But as always, you can set the initial state to be whatever you want. And then on the randomize tab, there are a bunch of new randomization options. Uh, so there's an entirely new randomization option, which is to randomize the current clip time of the agent. And then also several of the existing randomization options got some different ways of setting up the random distribution. I'll just jump over to an example of that. Uh, so when randomizing layers, previously uh, the randomization was based on a numbering system. So you would have to name your layers like variation 1, 2, and 3, and then you could set up a, a uniform random distribution between two particular numbers. So if you wanted to randomize between you know, 10 different layers, you could use these controls here. Uh, but there's a new option where you can set up your own custom distribution using whatever layer names you want to and control the specific weights that are used for each of those layers. So in this case, I just set up two layers. I've got my uh, default skin geometry, and then also a layer that I created that just has a hammer attached to the guy's hand. And so I can set up a specific weight that I want to use for the, the default layer versus the layer with the hammer attached to it. And so you can get some much more precise control over how likely agents are to use particular layers. And then on top of that, you can also use pattern matching or lists of layers. So I could do something like default and collision and have multiple layers in a particular group. And in that case, uh, the weight value here will be spread evenly between all of the layers. You can also use the standard Houdini pattern matching. So I could have done something like this, which matches all of the layers except for layer with hammer. Um, so you can do some fairly complicated uh, selection of different layers with that syntax. Uh, the other randomization options uh, for randomizing the initial state and randomizing different types of agent primitives um, also got the same equivalent type of uh, distribution option. So you can specify um, a distribution of different agent types based on names like mocap by bed one or archer or soldier, things like that. And then for states, you can also um, set up your own custom distributions for how the state should be randomly selected for each of the agents. One final thing to mention is that version 3.0 creates a lot fewer point attributes than it did before. 
Uh, so just as a side-by-side -side comparison, the default settings for version 2.0 create 18 versus just 8 now. Uh, a few of those were point attributes that weren't really necessary to create at the crowdsource shop. They can just be created by the crowd solver when it's needed. Um, and also a few things are now made optional, like setting the agent's color or creating a point group that contains the agent are now just things that you can turn on if you need them, but they're not done by default. And related to that, uh, version 3.0 of the crowd solver now creates all of the point attributes that it needs uh, if they haven't already been created. And so you don't actually have to use the crowdsource shop now if you don't want to. Uh, previously, it was sort of mandatory to use because it would create a lot of important point attributes that the crowd solver wouldn't uh, create and initialize appropriately if they weren't there. Uh, but now you can you can just use whatever tools you want to populate your crowds. You can just use a regular copy shop if you want, or if you're doing a really simple crowd simulation, just drop down an agent shop, and you can use that directly with the crowd solver. Uh, but the crowd source shop, shop is still, of course, uh, a useful thing to use for crowd layout and randomization. Before diving into the new versions of the crowd dot nodes, I just wanted to go through a few improvements to the shelf tools in 15.5. Uh, with the simulate tool, it'll actually now prompt you for which states you want to create in the simulation instead of just going ahead and creating a default walk, stand, and ragdoll state. Uh, so it'll give you a menu, based, and this menu is populated based on uh, what it thinks might be reasonable choices for states in your crowd simulation. So it'll look at the whatever values you had set up for the state point attribute, as well as the names of your animation clips, and then it'll also give you an option to create a ragdoll state if you want that. Uh, so then in this case, I'll just put down a couple states to demonstrate this. And then in the simulation, it just put down those states that I'd asked for, which match up with my animation clips. And so I've got a nice starting point to work with, and I don't have to worry about uh, changing around the state names that the simulate tool would put down for me. And all of the other shelf tools that deal with states in the crowd simulation, so setting up obstacle avoidance, path following, lookouts, and target positions, also give you a similar looking menu. So I'll just demonstrate that with the, the curve tool. Uh, then I'll just use the path tool to select that curve. And then it, again, gives you an option of whether you want to apply that uh, path following force to all of the states or just particular states. So in this case, I'll maybe just apply it to the walk state. Moving on to DOPS, there's a new version of the crowd state DOP, which is primarily aimed at adding more advanced controls over the animation clips that agents are using when they're in a particular state. So taking a look at the parameter interface, uh, the initial clip time controls are now optional. So if you want to set up your clip times ahead of time in SOPS and pass those through into the crowd simulation, uh, you can do that if you want to. But you still have the option, of course, of setting up the clip times in DOPS and doing a bit of random variation. Uh, the randomized clips option had a couple small changes to it. Uh, so you now have control over the random seed that's used. And the syntax that's used when matching clips that are in the agent's clip catalog changed a bit. So it used to be based on a substring match. So if you had a string like walked here, it would match any clip that started with walk. Uh, but now it uses the standard pattern matching syntax that's used by the, the agent layer randomization on the crowd source soft that I was talking about earlier. So you can do something like walk run star to match any clip that either is named walk or starts with run. So you can do some more sophisticated selection of clips with this approach. Uh, for in-place animation, there are a bunch of new controls, but I'll start off by just doing a quick review of that mode uh, just to provide a bit of background. So the in-place mode is primarily a particle-driven mode. Uh, so the agent's particle is driven by forces, and then its orientation is updated to follow along with the velocity direction. And then its animation clip is assumed to be in place, and it's played back on top of the particle, and it's retimed based on how fast the particle speed is. Uh, so the clip speed multiplier is new in 15.5, so you have a, just a global option on how quickly the animation clips would be played back. Um, if you want to vary that per agent, you can, of course, use the Vexpressions option here, but you can also just do some simple random variance with this built-in parameter. Uh, there's now an option for whether or not you actually want to do the retiming of the clip to match the particle speed, and if you do, then you can specify the gate speed as before. Uh, the variance parameter was actually moved into the crowd state dot from the crowd solver itself, so it used to be a global control, but now you can control it per state. And so this controls both a limit on how much you can retime the clip by, and then if the limit particle speed option is on, it also controls the minimax speed around the gate speed that the agent can travel at. So for the locomotive mode, I'll also do a brief review of how that works. So in contrast with the in-place mode that's primarily particle driven and where the animation clip is just retimed based on however fast the particle ended up moving, the locomotive mode takes a more animation driven approach. 
So the idea is that if you have source animation that's not in place, so the character has some sort of overall translation or rotation, uh, you want to extract that overall locomotion into a separate channel in the clip and then convert the animation back to being in place. And then what the crowd solver can do is it can take that locomotion channel in the clip and use it to drive the particle during the simulation to match the locomotion from the source animation while still allowing the particle to be uh, steered around and influenced by other forces like avoidance and path following and things like that. And then the animation clip, as before, is replayed on top of the particle. So what this lets you do is handle a wider variety of animation clips. So your clips don't have to involve characters that are just moving at constant speeds. They can be speeding up, slowing down, uh, turning around, walking backwards, and so on. And so I'll go through a, a quick demonstration of how the setup looks like for locomotive clips. Here I've got one of Milkat Bipet 3's animation clips, which is a character that's running forward, stopping, and turning around. Uh, so at the bottom of the agent stops parameter pane, and the agent ROP has equivalent parameters, there's an option to extract the locomotion from a particular node in the source character rig. And usually you'll want that to be something that's near the root of the transform hierarchy. Um, in this case, it's the hips. And then if I turn on convert to in-place animation, it'll extract the overall translation and also create a locomotion channel in the clip that contains that extracted translation. And so we can take a look at this in chops. Uh, here I was using the agent chop to fetch that agent primitives animation clip and then just a delete chop to isolate the channels that I was interested in looking at. And so we've got this locomotion channel here now that, con that contains the overall translation from the source animation. Uh, you'll notice that it didn't extract the overall rotation. And so in order to do that, uh, you need to specify the locomotion orient node. And so how this works is the overall rotation is extracted based on the vector between the locomotion node and the locomotion orient node. So you want this to be uh, a node in the character rig usually something like the upper leg joint, where the vector between those two gives you a good sense of the overall orientation. And so now you'll see it'll also have extracted uh, the overall orientation. And you can double check this again in chops. You'll see now that the uh, Rx, Ry, and Rz channels are now non-zero. Moving on to the crowd solver, there were a large number of changes to the parameter interface and behavior that I'll be going through. Uh, looking here at version 2.0, this animation behavior tab was completely removed because all of the parameters ended up being moved to more appropriate places. So the allowed variance parameter was moved over to the crowd state dop like I was describing earlier, and the source and destination blend ramps were shifted over to the crowd transition dop to be controlled per transition, and they affect how animation clips blend between each other during a transition. Uh, finally, these two locomotion parameters were shifted over to the particle tab because they control how the particle is influenced by the locomotion information in the clip. Moving over to version 3.0, because the animation behavior tab was removed, there's now just a single top-level group of folders. There's a couple new parameters that were moved here from the crowd source op, like I was describing earlier. So there's the max force parameter and the max turn rate parameter. And the default value for the max force parameter is actually now negative one, so it's off by default. There's a couple new parameters to control how the embedded pop solver behaves. So the update particles parameter controls whether the embedded pop solver is actually responsible for moving the particles or not. Uh, typically, that's something that you do want to have on. But if you're using the crowd solver as part of a larger multi-solver setup where there might be another pop solver later down in the chain that's responsible for integrating the particles, uh, you can turn that off here. Uh, the age particles and reap particles parameters uh, promote a couple of parameters from that pop solver that control how old particles are dealt with. This was something that could occasionally cause some surprising issues because on the pop source stop, the default life expectancy of a particle is 100 seconds. And so if your crowd sim stretched on for a few thousand frames, you could actually get to the point where the pop solver decided to delete those particles, and that could be a little tricky to track down and debug. Uh, so now deleting old particles is off by default, but you can turn that on if you want to. And aging particles, though, is still turned on because that can be useful for driving various effects. There are a couple new parameters that make it much easier to have agents update their orientation to follow along with the terrain normal, which is a common thing to do if you're trying to, for example, have bugs crawl up walls. Uh, so I've got a quick demonstration of how to set this up. So in this case, I've got a tube and two mocap bipet three agents, and I want to have one walk around on the outside and the bottom guy walk around on the inside upside down. Uh, so right now, all of the crowd solver settings are at their default, except for a terrain projection, which I've turned on, and the agents have a locomotive clip that's causing them to walk forward. So if I hit play, uh, the agents will walk forward and continually be pushed up onto the terrain by the terrain projection until they get too far to the left and the terrain projection so ray intersections don't find the terrain anymore. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is on the particle motion tab, uh, under the adjust up vector parameter, there's a new option 
that will have the crowd solver automatically set the agent's up vector to follow along with the current terrain normal. So if I hit play, we'll see that the agents do adjust their orientation now the way that we want. But as before, once they get to the midpoint, the terrain projection uh, starts to stop working. So the next thing to do is on the terrain tab, uh, we want to switch what direction the ray intersections are done in. So instead of always doing the ray intersections along the y-axis, uh, we want to use the agent's current up vector. So now if we hit play, we've actually got the effect that we're looking for. So the agents are walking around upside down and following along with the terrain normal. One issue that you can still run into is that if there are 3D forces in the simulation, like an avoidance force or a path steering force, uh, that can cause the agents to behave in unnatural ways, like being pushed up or down instead of steering to the left or right. Now you can see that in this example if you turn on the avoidance force. So as the agents get close to each other, the avoidance force is going to start pushing them away from each other. But that can actually conflict with what the terrain projection is trying to do, which is to push them back onto the terrain. And so you get this case here where the agents just end up sort of being stuck in place. There's a new option on the crowd solver called Project Forces, and what that will do is take the applied forces for the agent and project them into the plane defined by the agent's up vector. And so that'll cause the forces to only make the agent turn to the left or right rather than pushing them up or down. And so you can see that now in this case, with that option turned on, the agents will just shift over to the left or right to avoid each other. As a side note, the avoidance force does have a, a useful new option in 15.5, which is guide geometry that indicates the effective influence of the agent. And so you can see the effect of this combined with the agent's p-scale attribute plus the particle scale multiplier. The steering controls in the crowd solve were also changed quite a bit for 15.5. Uh, the orientation controls are fairly similar to before in that the max turn rate controls how quickly the agent's orientation is allowed to change, and the min speed control just controls uh, the minimum speed at which the agent's orientation can start changing, so that agents that are standing still don't spin around really quickly on the spot. Uh, the velocity of constraint, though, changed quite a bit. It used to be more based around uh, damping forces or velocities that were far away from the direction that the agent was currently facing. Uh, but the new option, constrained by max turn rate, uh, uses this same max turn rate parameter that's used for the orientation update to limit the velocity so that its direction can't change any faster than that max turn rate. And so what this does is it tends to make agents uh, steer in a more gradual manner rather than suddenly stopping, spinning, and turning around. And as a side note, it's also much easier for these new controls to affect agents with locomotive quips. Previously, it was very difficult actually to have an agent with a locomotive quip that was also following along with a path steering force or avoidance force. So I'll demonstrate that with this, this example here that has two groups of agents walking toward each other with the avoidance force causing them to move out of each other's way. So you can see with the new controls, the agents move in a much more gradual way. There's no more uh, stopping, spinning, and turning around very suddenly. One of the larger new features in 15.5 is some enhanced controls for dealing with transitions between animation clips. I'll start off though with a brief review of the existing behavior just to give a bit of context. So in the crowd transition dub, when the input trigger or combination of triggers like entering a bounty box or being close to another agent activates, then the transition into the new state can start. Uh, first though, there might be some random amount of delay that's added to that based on this max random delay parameter if that's enabled. But once that's over with, the transition into the new state can proceed. Uh, so the solver needs to figure out what animation clip it needs to transition into. Uh, so that happens by looking at what the output state is, and then on that output state, either taking directly uh, the specified clip name that agents in that state should be playing back, or if randomized clips is enabled, this parameter might be specifying a list or pattern of clips, in which case the solver will just randomly select one of those. Once it's figured out the clip that it's transitioning into, uh, then it starts playing back that new clip starting from time zero, and then blending into it from the current clip. And so the length of that blend is uh, controlled by this duration parameter, and how the blend weights are adjusted during that time is controlled by this blend ramp here. And then once you get to the end of that time range, uh, you can fully switch over to the new animation clip in the new state. So for 15.5, we wanted to add some more options to control the behavior of transitions between animation clips. Uh, one of the major problems that people could run into is that the trigger that activates the state transition can activate at any point during the animation clip. And it's not always the case that from every point in the current animation clip, you can transition sensibly into the new animation clip. It may only be that there's a particular region in that clip where you can actually do a proper blend into the new clip. And so we wanted to add the ability to delay the state transition after the trigger activates until you get into a region of the current animation clip where you can start transitioning into the new animation clip. Uh, related to that, 
It also doesn't always make sense to start the new clip at time zero. We wanted to add the ability to specify how the clips line up so that based on wherever you are in the current animation clip, you can pick a good starting point in the new animation clip so that you can blend in a nice manner. Those were the two main goals, but we also wanted to add a couple more features. Uh, one is making it easier to allow for transition clips in between uh, the clips on either state. So if, for example, you have a walk state and a stand state, and you're trying to go from standing to walking, you may want to have an intermediate clip, like a stand to walk animation of someone starting to walk, to use in between. And this is something that you could do before by setting up some intermediate states and adding additional state transitions, but that starts to um, clutter up the network a lot, and it doesn't scale as well if you have a large number of clips and also a large number of variations of clips. So we wanted to make it easier to inject those intermediate transition clips without a ton of extra work. Uh, related to that, if you're transitioning into a state where randomized clips is enabled, uh, it may not always be the case that you can transition into all of those clips. We wanted to be able to specify information about which clips can actually transition into each other so that we can limit that random selection to clips that you can sensibly transition into. So the first thought might be that the crowd transition top should get all of these new parameters, because that's the node that actually kicks off the transition between the animation clips. Uh, you quickly start to run into a few problems, though, if you try to do this. Uh, one is that this input state parameter doesn't just specify a single state. You can actually specify a list of states or a pattern of states. And then on top of that, each of those states could in turn have randomized clips turned on, which means that there are multiple animation clips that, could, that agents in that state could be in. And so there's a ton of different animation clips that agents that are taking this state transition could start out in. And so it doesn't really make sense to have controls that are very specific to pairs of animation clips on the crowd transition dot, because that would just clutter up the interface tremendously. And on top of that, uh, different states can reuse the same animation clips and just have agents that are behaving in different manners while they're in that state. And so again, you would have to duplicate those animation uh, controls in different crowd transition dops that are going between different states that are using the same animation clips. So it starts to make sense to try to separate the information about how animation clips can transition into each other from the information about which states are allowed to transition into each other under which condition. So the solution to this is to set up the information about the clip transitions ahead of time in SOPS, which produces geometry that describes what transitions are allowed to take place and how those transitions should take place. So how the clips line up and what region of the clip the transition can start from. And then that geometry is attached to the crowd object as subdata. And then the crowd transition dop can inspect that geometry during the simulation to figure out how to implement the transitions between animation clips that were requested. Uh, so one of the nice things about this is because you're setting it up ahead of time in SOPS, it's very easy to reuse it across simulations. And it's also very easy to preview ahead of time, which I'll demonstrate a bit later on. So you can test out your transitions between animation clips before you actually dive into DOPS and start working on your big crowd sim. It's a lot easier to isolate things and work on single transitions at a time in a simple manner. So the geometry format that the crowd transition DOP expects uh, represents a data structure kind of like this diagram on the left, which in more formal terms is a directed graph. Uh, so the geometry format is that each point is expected to represent an animation clip with a point attribute clip name that stores the name of that animation clip. And then polygons between those points represent a one-way or directed transition between those clips, so the vertex order matters. And then attributes on the primitive describe how the transition can take place. And these are array attributes, because the idea is that there can be one or more regions in clip A where a transition can occur. And then you have attributes that specify how, for each of those regions, the transition can happen. So for each of those regions, in addition to specifying the region of time, you can control the length of the transition, so how long to blend for, and also how the clips line up. So you specify a frame in the source animation clip that's in that transition region, and then a corresponding frame in the new animation clip where the poses match up. And then based on that, the solver can figure out, based on where you are when the transition started in clip A, where to start in clip B so that you can blend smoothly. The crowd transition dops help card describes all these attributes in detail, and I'll show a bit of this later on. So to set up this geometry, there's a new SOP in 15.5 called the Agent Clip Transition Graph SOP, and I'll give a demonstration of that. Uh, so the input to this SOP is expected to be an agent primitive. In this case, I've got a zombie with an idle, idle to walk, and walk animation. And on this SOP, you can specify how many transitions you want to set up the information for. Uh, so in this case, I've just got two, since I have three clips. Uh, and then for each of those transitions, you can specify the two clips that are involved, as well as how many transition regions there are in clip A. In this case, there's just a single region. And then for that region, you specify uh, the range of frames in clip A that that region covers, as well as how many frames to blend for when you're taking a transition out of that region. And then you need to specify the information about how the clips line up. And this is where the guide geometry option here starts to become useful. 
So the idea is that you want to specify a frame somewhere in this transition region in clip A, and then a corresponding frame in clip B that has a similar enough pose. And based on that, the solver can figure out where to start the clip in clip B based on where you are in clip A when the transition activates. So this guide geometry just shows you the pose that each agent has when it's at frame, this spe specific frame in clip A and this specific frame in clip B. And so you can easily use that to see um, how the clips line up and configure that. Now the second input on this SOP allows you to merge clip graphs together very easily. Um, if you just naively merge their geometry with the merge SOP, you'd end up duplicating all of those points. And that can really confuse the solver, as I'll describe a bit later on, when it's trying to traverse the topology of this graph to figure out which clips can transition between each other. If you have duplicate points, the solver is going to end up getting confused. So if you have a lot of animation clips and you don't want to just have a single clip transition graph SOP and you want to split this up into a few different SOPs to make it a bit easier to manage, uh, the second input will do a smarter merge and avoid duplicating the points. Uh, so to test out the results of this, uh, instead of just diving straight into DOPS, there's this transition uh, crowd transition test simulation asset that's very useful. Uh, so as the first input, you can pass it one or more agent primitives, and then in the second input, you can provide the clip transition graph geometry, and then this SOP will let you test out transitions between animation clips based on those settings. Uh, the extra inputs are for if you want to add in terrain and things like that to make uh, the, the simulation a little bit more complicated. Uh, most of the controls are on this first tab, the transition tab, which lets you specify the two clips that you want to transition between, what frame to trigger the transition at, and then an optional random delay. Uh, the train tab just has the usual train adaptation settings from the solver, and the simulation tab just has a couple of the standard dot network controls. The guides tab, though, has a few useful options to help you see what's going on. So it'll allow you to display different colors when the agent's waiting for a transition to start, uh, once the trigger is activated, but the transition is being delayed because you haven't reached a region of the clip where the transition can start, and then colors for when you're actually blending between the animation clips and when you're totally done. So in this case, for this idle to walk animation, you can see how the guide geometry changes to help you debug what's going on in case you had set up your information incorrectly. So now I'll jump over to DOPS to show how to set up the crowd simulation to use the clip transition graph. So on the crowd object top, there's a parameter where you can specify the path to the SOP that has the clip transition graph geometry. And once you do that, if you look in the details view under the crowd object, in addition to the geometry subdata, which has the agent's actual geometry, there's now a new piece of subdata that has the clip transition graph's geometry, which then can be referenced by the crowd transition DOP. Uh, to get the crowd transition DOP to use the clip transition graph, you just need to turn on this use clip transition graph option, which will then uh, let the solver use that instead of the old style controls for how the transition between animation clips should take place. So when a transition is triggered, the behavior with the clip transition graph is a bit more complicated than it was before. As before though, uh, when the transition is triggered, the solver needs to pick a new clip in the destination state to transition to. Now though, the solver actually has information about which clips can transition between each other, so it can limit that selection to clips that are reachable through some sequence of transitions between animation clips from the current clip. And so you can limit the random selection to clips that you can actually transition to. Uh, once it picks the new animation clip, then for each pair of clips along the shortest path from clip A to clip B, it can then proceed to transition between them. So for each pair of clips, it waits until the clip time in the current clip is in one of the transition regions where a transition can take place. Once it gets into that region, it then uses the current clip time relative to the synchronization point in clip A to pick the new clip time for clip B, and then blends into that clip over the specified duration. And then either it reaches the last clip and the transition's done, you're in the new state, or it moves on to the next pair of clips and does the same thing. So this allows you to uh, easily have transition clips between the clips in either state that you're transitioning between two without having any extra setup work. So now I'll show a quick demonstration of what this looks like. Uh, so in this example here, I have a bunch of agents that are starting out in an idle state, and then I want to transition them into the walk state after a few frames have gone by. Uh, so first of all, without the clip transition graph, you'll see that the uh, animation clips don't transition into each other very well. Uh, so the feet kind of slip around a little bit uh, when the transition activates. Uh, so with the clip transition graph, in this case, I had set up uh, transitions from the idle clip to the idle's walk clip, and then from the idle clip to the walk clip. And then once I uh, request a transition from the idle clip to the walk clip, the solver is able to traverse that geometry and figure out that it needs to transition from the idle clip to the idle to walk clip, and then from that into the walk clip. And so you end up with a very smooth transition.
before jumping into foot locking, which is another major new feature in 15.5, I wanted to cover a couple related changes in 15.5 that are important to talk about beforehand. Uh, so previously, uh, agents animation clips were only allowed to contain channels that described uh, the transforms of their joints. So for example, when a vclip file was loaded from disk, uh, Houdini would just search for channels that were named things like hips, colon, tx, things like that, channels that describe the uh, transforms of the joints, and then any other channels that didn't match that were just ignored. Uh, so this has been changed in 15.5 so that agent clips can have uh, any arbitrary extra channels. So when vclip files are loaded now, any channels that aren't transformed channels are still loaded into memory and you can sample them later on using either vex, there's an agent clip sample vex function now, and there's also an equivalent Python function. Uh, and to go along with that, when you're creating an anima agent's animation clip, either using the agent rop to write out a bclip file, or using the agent soft to create a clip in memory using like the scene mode, for example, there's a new parameter called the additional channels parameter, uh, which is right by where you're setting up related information about the animation clip. And what this does is it lets you point at a chop that contains any additional channels that you want to throw into the agent's animation clip as it's being created. One related new feature in 15.5 is a new chop called the agent chop. And what this lets you do is bring a clip from an agent primitive into chops. So we'll give a, a demonstration of what that looks like. So here all this stuff, put down a chop network and an agent chop, and then specify the path to the geometry that has my agent primitives in it. Uh, by default, it'll just uh, use the first agent primitive that it finds in that geometry, but you can use this group field if you need to narrow down the selection. And then select the name of the clip that you want to load. In this case, the default lock is matching what I already have. And then you can also control whether for the transform channels, you want them to be in local space or to be converted into world space. And then if you look at the animation clip, you'll see uh, something like this. So it's a useful tool if you want to um, inspect an agent's animation clip and you know, debug maybe what's going on in it, or if you want to take advantage of the fact that you can now have extra channels in agent's animation clips to bring an animation clip into chops, uh, add some extra channels and data to it, and then uh, have the agent load it back in. And if you want to have an agent load in, say, a new version of an animation clip or a totally new clip, uh, one way to do that is to use the agent clip swap. And so this allows you to uh, load a new clip in from a chop network and give it a name, or optionally to load it in from a vclip file. Now that we've covered some of the background information, we can move on to talking about some of the terrain adaptation and foot locking changes in 15.5. Uh, previously, the solver didn't quite have enough information to always be able to do the right thing when it came to adjusting the feet. Uh, it didn't know any information about when the foot was supposed to be planted or not, so all it could really do is that if the foot happened to be below the terrain, it could push it up and then do a, a quick IK solve to adjust the leg. But if the foot happened to be above the terrain, it just had to leave it as is. It didn't know if the foot was supposed to be planted or had to be above the terrain at that point. Uh, so if the solver has some of that information about when the foot should be planted or not, it can, as I mentioned, make sure that the foot's always planted down on the terrain at the right time. But on top of that, it can also do some other useful things. So if it knows when the foot's supposed to be planted, it can lock the foot in place and make sure that it doesn't shift around at all while the foot's planted. And so this gets to be important in a few cases. Like if the agent's, for example, following a path and gradually turning, you don't want the feet to be turning around uh, while it's on the ground. You don't want to see any sort of sliding like that. And then similarly, if it's blending between animation clips, if the animation clips don't perfectly match up with each other, the feet can also slip around a little bit. And so um, if the solver does know when the feet can be planted, it can lock the foot in place and make sure that you don't see any undesirable sliding motion. So now that in 15.5 we have this new ability to store extra channels in our animation clips, uh, we can take advantage of that to store the information about when the feet should be planted during the clip. Uh, so the format that we use for these channels is that a value of 0 means that the joint's not planted, it's totally free to move around, and a value of 1 means that it's planted and should be locked in place. Uh, if the value is increasing from 0 to 1 before the foot's locked, that indicates that it should be allowed to blend down towards the terrain. So this becomes useful if you're on very uneven terrain and your foot might suddenly get planted down onto some much lower terrain. Uh, having a couple frames of blending allows you to gradually move towards the terrain instead of having any sudden popping motion. And then similarly, if the foot is locked and then the value starts decreasing towards 0, that indicates that the foot should blend out of the locked position. And again, that helps to smooth out any sudden motion as the foot's released. Uh, once you've set up these animation, these channels in your animation clips, which I'll talk more about on the next slide, uh, there's just a couple things you have to do in order to get the crowd solver to use them. So first, on the agent prep soft, which is where you set up the information about uh, all of the lower limbs that your agent has that should be used for terrain adaptation, uh, next to where you specify the ankle and toe joints, uh, there's a couple new parameters where you can specify the names of the channels that describes when the ankles and toes should be planted. 
Uh, once you've done that, that just creates point attributes on the agent that contain that information. Then you just need to go to the crowd solver or alternatively the agent terrain adaptation dop, which is embedded in the crowd solver, and turn on the enable foot locking option, which will use those channels uh, during the simulation. So before going further ahead on the dop side of things, I just wanted to backtrack a bit and talk more about how you would set up these channels for your animation clip. Uh, so there's a new chop in 15.5 called the foot plant chop, which is designed to make it very easy to analyze and generate this information. Uh, but of course you can use any channels that you want in your animation clip for the foot locking. So if your source animation already has this information, you can go straight ahead and use that, or you can generate it using some other chops if you want to. Uh, but this is a, a pretty good way to do it. Uh, so I'll go through a demonstration of what the foot plant chop looks like. Uh, so there's three different options for what the input data is, so the transforms of the joint that you're trying to analyze. Uh, one option is to just use the input channels directly, so if you've already brought the uh, joints information into chops, you can go directly ahead and use that. Uh, the object mode uh, grabs the transform from a bone or a null or something like that in Houdini from a character rig, and then you can specify an optional offset relative to that, as well as the frame range to use. And then the final option is to, is to grab the clip from an agent primitive, so this basically just has an embedded agent chop inside of it, and then you can specify the path to the geometry, uh, the name of the clip to use, and then the name of the transform to analyze, again with an optional offset. Uh, once you've got the source information, which is uh, the transforms of the joint over time, uh, there's now a couple different options to analyze that and figure out when the foot's actually planted. Uh, one way to do that is based on a speed threshold, so whenever the joint's not moving by uh, more than the speed threshold, it's considered planted. Uh, this is a, a fairly easy mode to use because it's just a single parameter that you have to set up, uh, but it does have one issue that it can run into where if the, the joint uh, stops in midair, it can be considered planted even though it's not actually on the ground. So one case where this can come up is if uh, you're analyzing the ankle joint and the foot, the character's standing on their toes, it might look like the ankle's actually planted when it's really not. Uh, the other option, which is a more robust option, but that requires a little bit more setup possibly, is based on the distance to terrain. So you can either specify a plane to use, so in this case it defaults to the XZ plane, or you can just directly specify the path to some soft geometry, and then it decides whether the foot's planted or not based on the distance to that terrain if it's below this threshold. And once you've figured out when the foot's down or not, uh, there's just a couple more options to control. One is the name of the channel that's generated, in this case, I've just called it left ankle planted. Then you can control the number of frames to blend into the foot plant for, and also correspondingly the number of frames to blend out for. So now that we have the ability to generate these channels, we also need to add them into the agent's animation clip. And so the workflow for this will vary a little bit depending on how exactly you're setting up the clips that your agents are using. Uh, so if you're using the agent ROP, you can use that new uh, additional channels parameter that I was mentioning earlier on. So in this case, uh, on the agent ROP here for my walk animation clip, uh, I've pointed at this chop network for the additional channels to add into that animation clip. And then that chop network just has four foot plan chops that are analyzing my left and right ankles and toes. Um, and then those are getting added into the agent's animation clip and then I can use them during the simulation. Uh, so this is what the bake agent shelf tool will set up for you uh, when you use it because it's putting down an agent ROP, uh, writing out the agent definition and animation clip, and then putting down an agent SOP to load that in and construct the agent primitive. On the other hand, if you're trying to add these channels to the agent's animation clip after you've already initially created the animation clip, uh, you can use that workflow that I was talking about earlier on with the agent clip SOP. So one way to do it would be to uh, have an agent chop that loads the agent's original animation clip into chops, and then a few foot plant chops to build the channels that are describing when the ankles and toes should be planted, and then use the agent clip SOP to load that modified version of the agent's animation clip. Uh, the one issue with this is that it's a bit cumbersome to set up because if you don't want to duplicate the names of the ankle and toe joints on all of those foot plant chops, you'd have to do a lot of uh, manual parameter linking. And it would quickly turn into a bit of a chore to set up. So to make that easier, we've added an option on the agent prep sop to do this for you. Uh, the reason that it's on the agent prep sop is because it already knows what all of the names of your ankle and toe joints are and what the names of the channels are that you want to use. And so it can link up all of those parameters for you and make it very easy to set up. So on this additional channels tab, there's an option to create a foot plant chop network. And what that'll do is it'll create this chop network where for each of your agent's animation clips, it has an agent chop that loads in the source, or the original version of your agent's animation clips, and then foot plant chops for each of the ankle and toe joints that you had specified on the agent prep sop. And then on the, when this option is enabled on the agent prep sop, uh, it'll load uh, a modified version of the clip from each of the 
uh, chop nodes that are matched by this uh, wildcard pattern here. Optionally, if you want to cache this out to disk, you can just change the source to file and then uh, turn on uh, press this cache modify clips to disk button, which will write out those B clips to disk from those chop nodes and then load them in from there. So once you've got the foot down channels added to your animation clip and you've set up the agent prep stop to tell the solver what uh, the names of those channels are, all you need to do to turn on foot locking is on the crowd solver, turn on the enable foot locking option. And I'll do a quick demonstration before and after and point out some of the changes in behavior that you'll see. So in this case, I've just got an agent walking on some slightly uneven terrain and following this path here. So there's a couple issues that you'll notice without foot locking. One is the obvious sliding motion as the agent's turning around, uh, the feet are sliding a bit on the ground while he's uh, gradually turning. Uh, the other issue that you might notice is when he's on some of the downhill slopes, the foot isn't planted. And this is what I was mentioning at the beginning of this section when I was mentioning that the solver, without the information about when the foot's planted, doesn't know that it needs to push the toe down onto the terrain. So you'll see here that when he's on the downhill slope, the toe is kind of hovering above the terrain a little bit. Uh, so with foot locking turned on, let's see what that looks like. So now you'll see that as the agent's turning around, the feet are being locked in place uh, as he's turning, and so you don't get any slipping or sliding uh, when he's turning around. And then additionally, when he's on the downhill slope, uh, because the solver knows when the foot's supposed to be planted, uh, you can see that the foot actually gets uh, pushed down onto the terrain as you'd expect. Uh, during the simulation, if you find yourself needing to uh, debug what's going on with foot locking, so maybe the foot's getting stuck on the ground a bit longer than you think it should or something like that, uh, there's a useful guide geometry option here. So what this will do is it'll draw little uh, markers on each of the joints for the agent's lower limbs and color them based on the value of the foot down channel. So by default, they'll be colored green if the joint is free to move around and red if the solver is trying to lock it in place. So this makes it pretty easy to see what's going on and what the solver is trying to do versus what you're actually uh, versus what the results are that you're actually getting. And so it's very easy to spot if you might have some issues in your foot down channel where the foot's not being allowed to release or something like that. There's just a couple more things I want to mention to wrap up this section. So if there's no terrain, uh, you can still enable foot locking independently of the enable terrain adaptation setting on the solver. Uh, so without terrain, foot locking can still be used to prevent sliding if the agent's being steered around, but of course it won't do anything to help you plant the foot on the terrain if there's no terrain. Uh, but it is something that you can turn on even just for simple demos if you want to avoid foot sliding. And then also in 15.5, there's a new SOP called the Agent Terrain Adaptation SOP. And what that does is it basically exposes the same terrain adaptation behavior that you can get in the crowd solver, but you can do it at SOP level. And so this is useful for a couple cases. Uh, one would be if you have crowd shots where you're not even doing anything in DOPS and you still want to do a bit of uh, terrain adjustment for them, uh, you can make use of this SOP. And then also if you're trying to just readjust agents to different terrain after the simulation, uh, you can also make use of this SOP. Uh, the controls are exactly the same though as what you see on the crowd solver, uh, and you still have access to the same guide geometry settings if you're using foot locking. So I think that wraps up everything I wanted to cover in this masterclass, so thank you for watching.